Good morning. Thank you, Professor George, for your introduction. Before I start my talk, please join me in a brief, prayerful flight of imagination. I invite you to close your eyes. Settle yourselves comfortably in your seat. Feel your feet planted on the floor, on the ground that God has laid out for us. Let your hands lie relaxed in your lap. Become aware of your breathing as the air that God has given you to live fills your lungs and empties out again, streams in and streams out, like the waves on the beach rushing up onto the sand and running back out again. Now imagine yourself rising up out of the A.J. Gordon Memorial Chapel See your campus spread out below you, looking smaller and smaller as you rise swiftly higher until the whole world is within your vision. God's earth is now before you, the size of a basketball, beautiful and blue. Reach out your hands, literally, and gently take hold of this globe and bring it down into your lap. Move your fingers over the earth's contours. Dip your hand your one hand into the bracing cold of the Arctic Ocean, your other hand into the mild warmth of the Indian Ocean. Feel the cold, damp, sharp height of the Himalayas and the dry, warm, curvy flatness of the Sahara. Feel the branches of great trees lightly scratching your palms, the leaves of little bushes brushing against your fingers, and the waving grasses of the plains tickling your wrists. Your hands move over the rough, tough hide of a big elephant in the soft, silky smoothness of a little rabbit. With your mind's eye, you see every shape and color imaginable in the waters of rivers and oceans, on the mountains and plains, in the forests and deserts, on animals and people, an ever-transforming, ever-new rainbow kaleidoscope. Now you feel the differently textured hair of two little children one under each hand. You bring your lips down to gently kiss each of their heads. As you do so, you feel the scratchy claws of a small bird alighting on one of your fingers. No sooner than she lands, off she flits again, up into the breeze now playing around your face. And with the little bird, off floats the earth from between your hands, while you, like a feather, float gently down again. You see the campus that is, for now, your home spread out once more below you, and you recognize the spire of this chapel, signaling lives of worship being lived in this place. You float down through the roof again and back into your seat. You feel God's ground under your feet as God's breath blows quietly into you and out again to give you life. All that you've just seen and felt was good very good, all created by God out of pure love. Let us pray. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you. Thank you. Pure grace, pure love. Open now our minds, our hearts, and our very souls to your presence with us here now, O oh Emmanuel. Open us to what your word is for us, that we may be changed by it. Give us faith so strong that we can dare to doubt. Give us intellect so sharp that we can cut through even our own prejudices and unexamined assumptions. Give us hearts so filled with your light, love, and compassion that we can embrace you, ourselves, each other, and your whole creation. This, O oh God, we pray in the name of your Son, our Saviour and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. President Timon, Professor Marshall, Maxwell, administrators, faculty, staff, students, uh, a special thank you first of all to the Departments of Sociology and Philosophy, Centre for Student Development, the Office of the Provost, uh, Sarah Tang, Amber Woods and all of your 
team, the student organizations with whom you worked and have organized this inextricably bound conference. Thank you so much. Thank you for bringing me here. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you this morning and thank you for your attention here. I come to you from Cape Town. That's 7,700 miles away, Cape Town, South Africa. But the important thing is that I come to you as a member of the same body of Christ to which we all belong. Sometimes we may differ from one another as to exactly how we should understand God's word. And this is natural because we serve and worship a transcendent God. So the truth, the full truth, will always necessarily be beyond our grasp. But we all belong to the same Jesus movement. So we all have in common key points of reference in Scripture and in our experience of the love of God. I come not as one claiming any particular expertise or special insights, but simply as a fellow Christian on a journey like yourselves. So what is my starting point this morning? I set out from a place of gratitude, and I invite you to do the same. I'm overwhelmed constantly by a spirit of thankfulness for God being God, for the goodness of God's creation, for God's amazing grace, for God's infinite love, and for the hope that all will be well. Even when experiencing the darkness and brokenness of this world, it makes all the difference to how we respond if we approach from a place of thankfulness. The question I'm putting to you this morning, how is God's creation calling you into relationship, goes to the very heart of who God is, of who we are, and where we fit into the rest of God's creation, and what God's will is for us and for all his creation. So let's start at the beginning together. Who is God? God is creator of the universe, creator of all that is. God is God, the Alpha and the Omega. There is no other. God is one and God is three. As such, relationships are intrinsic to God's very, nat very, very nature. The relationships between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And between God and all that God has created and continues to create. God is good. God is love. Who are we? We are God's cre creatures. Created in God's image. We are God's children. We are God's beloved. What is God's will for us and for all his creation? For all his creation? God has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Ephesians 1, 9 to 10. So God's desire and purpose are to bring all creation into unity in Christ. This leaves the question of where we fit into God's creation as a whole. What is our relationship with our fellow animals and with all the myriad elements of God's creation? In Genesis 1, we see God affirming the inherent goodness of each and every element of his creation as he creates it. The heavens, the earth, the seas, the vegetation, and every living creature, animals and human beings. Clearly, God values all that he creates, and God blesses all life 
It is God who gives life to all living beings. As we read in Job 12.10, in his hand is the life of every living thing. We all have the same source. As we read in Ecclesiastes, I said in my heart with regard to human beings that God is testing them to show that they are but animals. For the fate of humans and the fate of animals is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and humans have no advantage over animals. For all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and all turn to dust again. Who knows whether the human spirit goes up goes upward and the spirit of animals goes downward to the earth. Ecclesiastes 3, 18 to 21. What we do know for sure is that God, like a good parent, loves and cares for all that he has brought into being. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. Psalm 147, 9. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the need, the desire of every living thing. Psalm 145, 15, and 16. In Exodus 12, 10, and Deuteronomy 5, 14, God commands that the Sabbath, the Sabbath rest, is for animals too. Truth is, the Lord is good to all and his compassion is over all he has made, as the psalmist says, Psalm 145, 9. We living beings are all precious to God, each one of us. Jesus himself tells us, even the hairs of your head are all counted and not even a single sparrow is forgotten in God's sight, Luke 12, 6 and 7. Something else that we know from Scripture is that God chose to give us humans special responsibilities. So back to Genesis 1, Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Here we must be very clear that in being assigned dominion over our fellow creatures, the biblical meaning, in the words of my friend and mentor, Bishop Jeff Davies, and I quote him, is to nurture, look after, and protect. For this world is not ours to possess. It belongs to God, and we have to look after it, unquote. Or as Charles Camozzi has put it, this kind of rule or dominion has been revealed to us primarily in the person of Jesus Christ, who interpreted his lordship not as domination, but as servanthood. We are called to be like Jesus and use our dominion to serve and protect the most vulnerable. This includes, writes Kamozi, vulnerable non-human animals. With Christ as our guide, human dominion over creation must be about self-sacrificial love, unquote. Now, crucial here to bear in mind in this particular context is that God made his covenant not just with humankind, but with all living beings on earth. So in Genesis 9, 9 to 10, God says to Noah, I'm... I'm establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature, with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. And this is repeated several times uh, in, in Genesis 9 between verses 11 and 17. So Genesis 9, 13 reads... 
I have set my bow, my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So God makes his covenant not just with humankind, but also with every living creature. And not only with every living creature, but with the earth. And what is at the heart of this covenantal relationship? with us all. Love. Love. God's love for us and all that he created. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John 3.16 So then how does God want us, his creatures, to be with one another? Everything in scripture Everything in Scripture indicates that God wishes his creatures to reflect, share, and reciprocate his love, and for us to be at peace with him and with one another, the peace which passes, surpasses all understanding, Philippians 4, 7. And I'm sure that you all are familiar with the classic description in Scripture of God's peaceable kingdom in Isaiah 11, 6 to 9. I'll remind you. The wolf shall lie down with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. How beautiful is that? And what does God want specifically for, from us as humans? The succinct and at the same time, most comprehensive answer that we have to that question is that given us by Jesus himself. So when one of the Pharisees, a lawyer, asked him, Teacher, which commandment, is the law, uh, which commandment in the law is the greatest? You all know this. Jesus answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Matthew 22, 36 to 40. The Pharisee then follows up by asking Jesus, who is my neighbor? Luke 10, 29. And Jesus responds. Remember how Jesus responds. Jesus responds... By not telling the Pharisee who his neighbor is, but he responds with the parable of the Good Samaritan. And what fascinates me about this is how in the process, Jesus flips the Pharisee's question around. He doesn't tell the Pharisee about who is and who isn't his neighbor. He tells, remember, the story of the, of, 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 of the Good Samaritan. He doesn't talk about whether the person lying abandoned and injured on the side of the road is or isn't his neighbor. He asks the Pharisee, was it the priest or the Levite or the Samaritan who was the neighbor, who was the neighbor to this person? So in effect, he tells the Pharisee, you are the neighbor. You are the neighbor. By implication, to whomsoever needs you to be a neighbor. So our question, unlike the Pharisees, is not who is my neighbor, with its implied corollary of who and what isn't my neighbor, but rather, am I the neighbor? Is it a relationship as neighbor into which I'm called? 
Is the question then not, where do I draw the boundaries of my neighborhood? Am I a neighbor only to the people in my hood? Am I a neighbor only to people like myself? Am I a neighbor only to people? Am I a neighbor to animals as well? Am I a neighbor even to trees, rivers, mountains, and oceans? Or in other words, where do I draw the boundaries of my caring, the boundaries of my kindness, the boundaries of my compassion? Now ask yourself, does God draw boundaries around his caring, his kindness, his mercy, his compassion? Does he? And the answer can only be no, absolutely not. God's love and compassion and mercy is infinite. Says the psalmist, your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. Psalm 36, 6. In Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Colossians 1, 19 to 20. So looking back at this point, we can see that the whole story of God and us, as we read it in the Bible, and as we've experienced it through history, is a story of God calling us into relationship with him. What we as humankind seem to have increasingly come to overlook or forget is that the story of God calling us into relationship with him is at the same time a story of God calling us into relationships of love and unity with one another and with our fellow creatures. God has made us part of this extraordinary, awesome living system. And we are intrinsically connected to every other part of this living system. Inextricably bound together. I love what I found on uh, your Gordon College website on the missions service and outreach page, and I'll quote it back to you. Because our faith is deeply rooted in relationship with God, with others, and with the creation, we believe that our learning should also be rooted in these relationships. Yes. Yet, so many of us human beings have allowed ourselves in our heads and in our hearts to become disconnected disconnected from our fellow creatures, disconnected from the earth, and to that extent even disconnected from God. This is the tragedy of humankind's fall. The tragedy of our sinfulness. Being disconnected, we don't care. With the priest and the Levite, we pass by on the other side, averting our eyes from the one who lies naked, beaten and left for dead by the side of the road. We've forsaken our sacred roles as nurturers, carers, and protectors. We've turned on each other and on the earth. We've come to treat the rest of creation as if it belongs to us and not to God as if it is property to use and abuse at will without regard to God's will. The bitter fruits of our broken relationships with each other, with other living creatures, and yes, with God, 
are on display all around us in the earth to, uh, in the world today. As the earth cries, God's creation calls out to us, calls us back into relationship with our fellow beings, with our home, the earth, and with God himself. And what does such relationship entail for us? It entails, I would suggest, firstly, repentance. Repentance. Repent of how we limit our God, our love for God, by limiting our love for God's creation. Repent of the harm we do to the earth and the injury we do to our fellow creatures if not ourselves individually, then indirectly, corporately. Just think, for example, of the pain, suffering, indignity, disrespect, and ecological damage caused by the factory farming of animals that end up on our plates and ultimately in the very cells of our own bodies. Repent of the violence we do to each other by participating in and allowing to continue a global politico-economic system that causes billions of people, billions of people around the world to suffer hunger and starvation even while there is sufficient food produced to feed quite adequately, adequately the entire world population. Repent of the violence we do to each other, participating in and allowing to continue systems of patriarchy that cause billions of women to be violated physically and emotionally, deprived of education, and in many parts of the world doing the bulk of productive labor while having little or no control over their own lives. And of course, True repentance is about much more than simply saying, I'm wrong, I'm sorry, I repent. It's about changing my ways. We have to, in the words of John the Baptist, bear fruit worthy of repentance. Matthew 3, 8. It's about dying to ourselves and becoming renewed through Christ. It's about participating in God's plan to do his will on earth as in heaven. As we reconnect or reconnect more deeply, God revives within us his caring spirit. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36, 26. If our hearts are true and our faith firm, then through prayerfully deepening our understanding of God's word, and our understanding of God's world, we shall be shown what to do. And be sure of this, whatever the specifics are for each one of us individually, it will involve obeying those two greatest commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I pray for you as you journey onward, deeper into your relationship with God, with your fellow creatures, and with the earth. Thank you.